You know, there's one race that uh, you look forward to all season, you know, especially in the off season when you're training, uh, and it's Le Mans. Seldom in your life, when you look forward to something for as long as I have, does it exceed your expectations, and every part of this event did just that. It's the first time, and I'm kicking myself, like, why I didn't come here like 10, 15 years ago. You know, you get chills uh, up and down your spine every time you come out here. First hour highlights, and as the trickle of flu, Alan McNish led this 50-car field into turn one. Look to the left, though. There's Jan Lammers, the racing for Holland Dome, making a move. And then Fabio Babini caused the first full-course yellow, a massive accident from one Aston to another, and quite a substantial oil leak on the 007 pole-sitting GT1 car. And early on, at the 45-minute mark, Frank Beeler put a move on his teammate Alan McNish to take over the lead of this race, but look how close this was. The Pierre Bruno LMP2 car almost took out one of the R10 Audis. Welcome back to Le Mans, everyone. Lee Diffie along with David Hobbs and Dorsey Schrader. And the Aqua Velva race reset shows you where we are at after the first hour. It seemed like the longest lead-in but it's great to get this first hour out of the way. Let's get it down to the pits. Calvin Fish, what do you have for us, Cal? Well, we're down here with the guy who had that massive shot in the early going, Fabio Babini. Fabio, first of all, are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Only the problem was uh, the race. It was very long, but the, after four laps, I touched the oil with another car. In the corner karting, I did this was a big, big problem for... Uh, for the control of the car because not have a place, not have, not have a space uh, in the outside of the of the corner for to control the car. I have a big crash, but uh, I'm very incredible. Very disappointed, I'm sure. Were you feeling the oil, Fabio, before you got to that? Yeah, it is. I'm checking from me the Aston Martin with uh, David Brabham. I have a little uh, look at the rear wheel, but. Uh, Immediately for me to start uh, braking in this case, they have more more oversteering. It's incredible, but in this case was a big big crash uh, and big big. Okay, problem. sorry to see you out. We got to get back. I think the Corvette may have a problem. That's right. The 63 Corvette has spun. Look at the big skid marks. They tell the story. Whoa! And finally gets back in the right direction. Wow, well, he's had a spin, and he's lucky he didn't make contact. At least it doesn't look like he made contact. But he backed up on the circuit. It's usually not a good thing. Of course, he had to get room to spin that car around. Well, I wonder if he got caught up in some other traffic. It's not like him to be uh, making just a mistake like that. Oh, we, we caught it at the end, unfortunately, right there. But the car was totally backwards. Here, the guys get ready. Probably going to do tires, maybe flat spots, I would assume, Lee. Yeah, that when you, that is a scary place to have a spin here at Circa de la Sarf. But Johnny O will bring that car in. And the guys will go to work. We do have an onboard replay of that. Here we go. Take a listen, see what happens here. Yes, there was contact. There, I thought I saw a dent in the guardrail, but you don't see much of a dent in the back of the Corvette. That looked like almost like a cold tire. You know what I think it? he was trying to do? I think he was trying to stay out of the way of the of the Audi, and he got offline. And there's a bit of dust and rubber collecting there already. The old clag is starting because there's a long way to go yet. And I think he just lost concentration looking in the mirror for the Audi. Well, we've got Brian Till, Calvin Fish, and Andrew Marriott in pit lane. The boys will update us as the Corvette team go to work to assess it. How does it look, Calvin? Well, Johnny O is staying behind the wheel. I just had a quick word with Doug Feehan. I said, what caused it? He said he had been reporting some kind of steering issue on the car, so they're certainly going to be taking the car in. There's a little bit of damage here on the rear clip where he made contact with the tire wall. I assume I haven't seen the pictures, but they're going to get this thing fueled up. They're going to spin it around and put it back in the garage and affect some repairs here. John Lee looks like he's going to stay in the car, but uh, these guys can work miracles. But right now, we're seeing the Aston having problems early and the Corvettes. We didn't see that last year. Well, talking about steering issues, that's just superficial. That body damage won't do anything to the car, and it didn't hit on that rear wheel, which is good. 
But uh, I can't I don't believe know. how little damage there is because it did give that old guardrail a pretty good belt. Yeah, it gave it a thump bar. Right? I mean, he could be having power steering failure or uh, any number of things. Max Pappas standing by, of course, the trio of Ron Fellows, Johnny O'Connell, who is now out of the car, and Max Pappas standing by. Well, Johnny's gotten out. Max getting in, or about to get in, it looks like. Yeah, it's a hot day today, and if you can get away with not double stinting, the Audi guys are double stinting. If you can get away with it, uh, obviously you're better off. Now, we are expecting the 16 Pescarolo to be in shortly, and that is the end of pit lane where they are situated. Yeah all the way down at pit in they are the first two garages in this very lengthy pit lane here at le mans andrew yes indeed well this is the old porsche garage of course down here this has seen a lot of winning cars this first garage looks as if a second set of uh, michelins is going on this car remember this is the car which stopped very early and they wheeled the michelins away i think they're not going to add those uh, very interesting these are michelin tires that are going on to the Pescarola, if indeed they do were developed for the new audi they are taller and larger than the tires which were used last year and indeed Pescarola have had to uh, change all the mud guards of the car if you will no tires required Manu Collard goes out and of course that car on a different fuel strategy to the Audi so uh, very good pit stop there and they're happy with the tire wear too this is the car that took the fight to the Audis last year until a gearbox problem took them out of the fight for the lead can they go all the way this year of course the mud guards that they are, Andrew is referring to are the fenders in the United States <laughs> well, exactly <laughs> And those those big bulbous fenders at the back because the tire's taller. Well, let's get an update on uh, Corvette. Calvin is there with Johnny O'Connell. Well, Johnny's just giving a report here to the engineer. And we'll try and listen here. Just uh, got away from me, so... Other than that, other than that, it's pretty good. I mean... Was it, was it, was it loose? Just got loose it was time? starting to go loose. No, for the most part, we were good. So, Johnny, big problem out there, mate. What was going on? You know, we... Uh, Try and get out of the way here so the boys can work. We, uh, no, we, we've got a really good car and uh, getting towards the end of the stint on those tires. And uh, to be honest with you, I don't know whether I got into something or uh, it just got away from me. I mean, it just real slow, lazy spin that um, I didn't think I was going to have the room there to, to, to catch. So, uh, you know, hopefully these guys can get a fix pretty quick. But, uh, I saw the Audis coming up behind you. Was that an issue at all, Johnny, or were you just doing your own thing? No, I was doing, doing my own thing. I wasn't worrying about those guys too much. And... Uh, it, uh, you know, and we got, you know, our guys spotting, letting us know where they are. But, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's frustrating. I, I feel bad for all the guys that, you know, work so hard. You don't like to get into your, you know, first one and a half steps to do this. But better now uh, than later. We got plenty of time to go here, and uh, who knows what's going to happen. All right, mate. Hang in there. Well, we heard him talking about the car being loose. It was starting. He told, uh, told his uh, engineer that the car was starting to get loose toward the end of the fuel or the stint on those tires. So... Uh, that's something we can watch as the race goes on. That was, you know, pretty early on to have the tires going on. Well, exactly. That means there'll be no double stinting or no. looking unlikely to be double stinting. The view from the front. This is race leader Alan McNish. And just look at the speed differential between the LMP1 car and the GT2 car. That's one of the painos. She actually magically disappeared there. Yeah. I know. I love that new camera angle, by the way. There's a new cool. company in charge of the uh, worldwide feed here at Le Mans this year and they've done a good job in relocating some of the camera positions as Alan whips by one of the Spiker Squadron GT2 cars. We've got a Ferrari. very slow moving red. Is that the leader? Yeah. Is that the 87 car? That's... It's the red, it's the red Ferrari. I didn't get the number but it's it's limping along there and that's why that wa waving white flag is a slow moving vehicle flag. laps down for Alan McNish as the Audis continue to lead. We'll be back. <laughs> Speed's coverage of the Michelin 24 Hours of Le Mans is brought to you by the all-new 2007 Lexus ES350. The car that asks, is it possible to engineer desire? 
new and improved Just For Men hair colour targets only the grey. Ain't nothing like it. And by Aqua Velva. Aqua Velva keeps your face toned and fit. You know what women say, it just feels better with an Aqua Velva man. Well, Dorse, you can take the hair colour. David, you can take the Aqua Velva and I'll take the Lexus. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> I don't think I came out on the If you have the aqua velvet and you have the hair colour, then you can get, get Alexis. Alexis. Exactly. Back to things here at the Michelin 24 Hours of Le Mans. And we get a look a little further down the order at one of our American teams, the Asemco Motorsports, Celine. The trio of Johnny Molum, Terry Borchella and Christian Fittipaldi. And wasn't that telling earlier when Christian said after the fabulous career he's had in both Champ Car and Formula One, he's even done a little bit of stock car racing to say he's kicking himself, he's left it this long, that this is his first appearance at Lasaf. Well, Johnny O'Connell said, you know, makes the hair on the back of his head, you know, go goosebumps all over when he comes here, but it is, there is something about this place, there's no doubt about it, it is an awesome track to drive on. 63 back out on track with Max Pappas behind the wheel, that's a good sign. It wasn't a good sign seeing it spin and crash into the barrier but the Corvette boys can fix cars like no other and Max is on his way and speaking of Pappas as we continue to watch the uh, Asemco Celine, Pappas said he had the scariest drive of his life the other night during that wet qualifying session he said his foot was buried to the floor but he couldn't see anything and he said it reminded he thought he was in the movie Days of Thunder he said it was fog clear fog clear and he just had to believe himself that he was going to be okay talk to marco verner as well several drivers actually who said that this they've done some paving on this racetrack and it's brand new and when that rain came out the other night it just turned into a skating and marco said it was the scariest drive he's ever had his entire life almost crashed the car uh, he said he saw a flame which was the downshift off of the tailpipe it was about one foot in front of his car he never saw the car just the flame it's a massive weekend for the 64 corvette they are going for the hat trick of class victories and ollie gavins with cal he is and they've also got a remarkable record going on over in the states with eight consecutive victories but ollie gavin great opening stint now are you surprised the problems we're seeing with some of the other gt1 cars falling off the road well, it, it, is, it seems to be uh, very tricky out there at the moment. It, every corner, every lap has a different characteristic. Some, sometimes it'll have a lot of grip, and the next, the next time coming around, it'll be, you'll be sliding all over the track, and the braking zones are quite tricky. It seems that there are a lot of people either putting oil down or fluids down or going off the track, dragging stuff back on. So you have to be really paying attention with the marshals looking and seeing on the track. And, um, I know for sure that Mulzan Corder and Arnage is very bad at the moment, so I just warned Olivier about that. Um, but the start was a bit crazy because that, there was a P car that was very slow, or almost stalled, I think, and it bottled Darren up. So I then nipped to the left to pass Darren, and I just borrowed Pedro. And then I had a bit of a look on, on the outside of Pedro coming into the first chicane, and, and I thought, well, it's a long race. There's a long way to go. Don't risk anything right now, just saying behind him. We seem to just about have the legs on them if we needed to, to push. The boys got us to lead the pit stops, as they always do. And, uh, you know, managed to just pull a little bit of a gap. But I think it's going to be tight, nip and tuck all the way. I can't see that there's going to be any let up. It's going to be flat out for 24 hours. All right, mate, get some rest. Thanks. Just a quick update on the other machine. The 63 car is now back on track. They had to change out the rear wing and the tow rod end. So little bit of a problem but quick repair here by the Corvette team let's go to Andrew and repairs here on the number 50 car as well the scarlet red Ferrari car down is out the veteran Vaughan Hauser is in turning a bit lucky here it's torn up some of the rear bodywork as you can see but just above that bodywork there's a little sticker boys and I think that this is a rather dodgy website I'm not going to give you the web address but it's something to do with a girl called Julie over to you Brian do you know Julie Martin was in during that last break. Thomas Inga stayed in that car. Tire and fuel is only, and that is significant because if you'll remember last year, drivers in those Aston Martin suffered significantly from the high temperatures in that cockpit. Now, the team has done a lot to reduce that temperature this year, correcting a lot more air.
through the front of the car and cooling those drivers. It seems to be paying dividends. It is over 90 degrees out here on the racetrack, and it's got to be well over 120 in the car. Pedro Lamy stayed in, I should say. So it's Audi 1 and 2, Mignition Bieler, Montagne for Pescarolo on screen on the right hand side as he comes by the Chamberlain Synergy prototype and his teammate Emmanuel Collard is third followed by the Courage Mugen in fifth place the trio of Jean-Marc Gounon and the two Japanese drivers. It was interesting to hear what Oliver Gavin said then about the track because I've been watching the, uh, the scoring monitor here and uh, everybody's best lap compared to what they're doing right now are significantly different. The best lap that the Montagne did was a 3.36 early on. He's now doing 3.41s. Collard did a 35. He's now doing 45. The Courage, uh, number 13, doing 30, 48s as was doing 38s. The only guy that doesn't seem to be oblivious to the whole thing is Alan McNish, who's just done a, a, a 3.35. His best is a 3.33. So, the track does seem to have slowed up a lot, and it seems to be affecting the bigger cars more than the uh, prototype one. And remember, some of these guys on double stints, particularly McNish, is on a double stint on his Michelins, uh, so you would expect some fall off. But some fall off anyway, yeah. But obviously there has been some oil and stuff dropped around the track. There you see Alex Jung in the dome that was running so well it was up to third, then had the drive-through penalty. And um, then Jan Lambers came in early because he thought he had a puncture from the puncture sensor, and it wasn't. And of course, nobody was ready for him. <laughs> so of course, a he, a long he did stop. the right thing and blamed his teammate. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> didn't take any, didn't take any himself. Well, Alex Jung has uh, had a fair variety of driving experiences, hasn't he, since his Formula One days for Minardi. He's since gone on and raced A1 Grand Prix, won a race there. He's even done some V8 supercar racing in Australia and the creation. Auto Sportif is in the lane. These guys Again. have had a tough start to the race. Dreadful start. Alex Young actually has pulled that car up. He was down to 10th. He's now back to 7th. So uh, he, in fact, um, his best lap was a 3.39, or the car's best lap was a 3.39, and his last lap was a 3.39. So it Looks like now they're looking at the front of it. We, did, we reported rear brake problems and sat there for quite a while now. Now they're not working on it at all, so I'm not sure. Well, they had all the master cylinders off, didn't they? But, all the brakes, so... Montagne's in. This is the 17 Pescarolo. Andrew is standing by. Yeah, Frank Montagne's in here, the uh, pink helmet of the uh, current uh, Formula One driver for Super Curry Racing. And uh, the team ushering all the cameramen away. It's a bit of a scrum down here, as you can imagine. They have another set of Michelin's ready to go on this. these new tour. I said developed for the Audi role in this car, but it certainly worked well on it. And uh, some probably we are jostled here a little bit, but no, they decide to stay on that uh, set of tyres. So uh, they're getting some very good tyre wear on the uh, Pescarolo, and this team seems very happy at the moment. Okay. One of the drivers from the lead Audi is, of course, Dindo Capello. First of all, Dindo, happy 42nd birthday to you. Sorry, I don't... Happy birthday! Your ah, hearing's thank... going, you're getting old! <laughs> thank you very much, thank you very much. I, I, was not, I don't think at the moment of my birthday. I just followed the race and it uh, was a really tough, the beginning of the race. Now it looks like uh, it, it got a little bit um, quieter, but you know, in a few laps I will be in the car and I'm still... I'm already thinking at the, of my driving. Talking about being quiet, this new diesel power plant that you're racing with this year is quite remarkable in terms of its speed, but from when you're behind the wheel, how does it feel? What's the difference? What's the sensation? Yeah, the sensation at the beginning was really strange because, you know, you don't hear nothing. You, you don't get any help from the engine noise. It's so quiet that you just feel the, the air on your helmet. And especially here in Le Mans, when you drive through the Porsche corner and you just feel how the car behaves at the beginning, it's, it's really, really strange, but at the end, it's unbelievable. I would say good, unbelievable good, because with your body, you feel every small movement of the car. That, uh, that's really, really, I, I like it a lot. Okay, one final question. Now, when you were running the American Le Mans series, you didn't have any gray hair, and suddenly it turned gray overnight. Were you tricking us for all those years with some Brian Till hair color? Did you have hair color before? I, I have it for quite a while because I thought when I was 28, 30, I said, oh, grey hair make me older. But then at one stage, 2003, I said, okay, if I win Le Mans, I stop to colour it and then I stop. I, I 
actually, I stopped after pre-qualifying already. <laughs> when I did Le Mans 2003, I was already getting gray. All right, mate, good luck. <laughs> so you, you got to assume that uh, Brian Tiller looked just like that too, then. If... <laughs> yeah, he would. Probably was, actually. Dindo Capello. He's won one in an Audi. He's won one in a Bentley. Can he go all the way again? They've relocated the famous Ferris wheel here at Circuit de la Sarthe, and this will be lit up beautifully later tonight. Back shortly. The combination of front-engine cars and 24 hours of intense racing at Le Mans, especially in hot weather, can mean some brutal conditions for drivers. Just ask Justin Bell, who suffered heat exhaustion after getting out of his Corvette in 2000. David Brabham was another example after he got out of the Aston Martin DBR9 late in last year's race when temperatures inside the cockpit allegedly reached upwards of 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, I've, I've never experienced anything like this in my life. It's just so incredibly hot in that car at the moment. And um, it just, my, my right leg just cramped up, seized up. I couldn't do anything with it, so I just had to come in and change driver. It's just, oof, it's just way too hot out there at the moment. And as a result of that, and many other examples, the ACO next year are trying to mandate air conditioning in closed cockpit cars. David, your thoughts? Well, it's going to be very, very difficult to achieve it correctly. Obviously, a street car, uh, probably at the worst set case, of, uh, might have an ambient temperature inside of about 110, 120. If you're going to try and cool down a car that's at about 170, which is full of holes and everything in the car is red hot. It's not insulated in any way, shape or form. The pedals get hot, the tunnel is red hot, the floor's hot, the steering wheel's hot. I don't think it's going to work. I think we're going to have to, you know, really concentrate more on keeping the driver cool with driver cooling equipment, a cool seat, a cool hat. You know, air into the air into the helmet would be huge or get air somehow blown up your trousers as the uh, as the song goes. And Dorsey, there is one car in this field this year, which is the Luke Alphonse Adventures Corvette. He is running air conditioning. I guess it'll be interesting to, to judge from his race and ha how the performance, whether it's affected and the, those internal cockpit uh, conditions whether they have been improved well there's a lot of different uh, a lot of different things that is be, are being done by different teams I've driven uh, obviously in those cars most of my career in 150 degrees you know we wear cool suits with driver aids with helmets and so forth all that being looked at but the ACO is way out of bounds with what they want they want to keep the temperature of the inside of the car under 38 Celsius Which so won't happen. it'll never happen because you park your car out in the parking lot with the windows up in the summer you'll probably hit 45 Celsius somewhere in there and of course Doug Fian uh, who's the general manager of the uh, Corvette program is working on some uh, driver aids which he's working with the ACO and the FIA to try and uh, not change the rule but well yeah change the rule and, uh, and have a more realistic uh, way of approach of keeping the drivers cool which have to be done and uh, you know the modern driver suit for instance that clocks up about 30 degrees right there under the suit. Well, they're working on that, too. Uh, the people at Sparco are trying to design a suit that breathes better, letting some of the air in and back out again um, to try to keep the body at the core temperature of the driver uh, down. And it's normal that your temperature of your body, 105 degrees in racing conditions, is what it is. I mean, that's, no that's a normal, but when you get really superheated, you know, I've burned well, my hands. Once you get about 106 or 107, then... If your core temperature's up there, then you really have got danger. Your hands and feet can get very hot, you're right. And a lot of uh, Nextel Cup drivers used to burn their feet on those hot floors, but... Then they've done that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. One driver used to driving, driving closed cockpit cars is with Calvin Fish right now. Well, Tracy Groen is another one of the drivers here with the White Lightning team who are making their debut here at Lamar. How has the experience been for you thus far? So far, we've had nothing but, uh, but great times, except perhaps... Uh, session second practice session at night in the rain I uh, could have done without that but uh, but anyway we learned a lot know a lot more about the track now uh, Nick's out in the car now so uh, so I should be in half an hour or so really ready for it talk about those conditions on Wednesday evening we saw some of the best in the business Tracy have major offs how difficult was it to be driving out there with the teeming rain well, you know when you hear guys like Andy Wallace and, and Max Pappas saying no, that was the scariest thing they've ever done, and, and you got to believe that that, uh, that that the boys from experience says maybe we shouldn't have all been out there. Good luck the rest of the way. Enjoy the experience, Tracy. Thank you very much. And of course, he is teamed 
with Jörg Bergmeister. And take a look at this graphic because these drivers that are here this weekend and the respective American championships that they're leading. And there is Jörg Bergmeister leading the Rolex Sports Car Series Daytona prototype class. So it will be interesting to see how that Chrome White Lightning Porsche performs here this weekend. Well, Alan McNish, our leader, pitted the first time with the Audi on the 14th lap. That being said, in two laps, we can expect him again. And he's not going to sneak by me on this mileage issue. I want to see what they're up to. So, but if it follows suit, we would expect him in the next two laps. Lexus scoreboard shows you our positions as they scroll through overall. And it still remains the Yoast Audis 1 and 2 on board with the CompuAir Corvette. Passing one of the LMP2 cars. You see how much power that 7 liter Thunder Mountain motor does. Uh, the way it comes off those corners, just enormous grunt. You would expect the uh, P2 car to probably repass at the other end of the straightaway. This is the class leading LMP2 car, Chris. Uh, We'll get it back to Chris Neville in just a moment. Tommy Erdos has done a brilliant opening stint. And this is the class defending car as well for RML. Change to the AER engine this year, though. It is a very strong combination of Tommy Erdos, Mike Newton, and former overall winner Andy Wallace. But that AER engine is yet to make 24 hours in competition. It's done so on the dyno, but never in competition not well, yet of course it's pretty small 1.9 liter call it two liter turbocharged four cylinder it has to do an awful lot of work to drag the car around here at speed traffic jam coming down the straightaway and that's the sort of thing that you can come unglued in uh, when you're lapping a group of traffic like this they're all watching each other they're concentrating on the guy they're trying to pass and you can come sneaking up behind them and uh, I noticed that these uh, LMP1 drivers are pretty loath to give anybody any room. They come rushing through, which always looks a bit brave to me, especially when you're doing the 24-hour race. Warren Hughes here for Chamberlain Synergy in the 39 on the left of screen, doing a good job. And he's had a bit of a musical chairs lead up to this year's 24. He was part of that successful trio of the RML team that we saw last year win P2. But he had a ride then got shuffled out. It looked like he was going to be in the Pano's LNT car, then got shuffled out of that. And after the 39 Chamberlain Synergy car was crashed heavily at the test day, and that driver was unable to continue, Warren Hughes was then drafted into that team. The 007 is serviced and gone as we continue. The Michelin 24 hours of Le Mans. It is an Audi Pescarolo battle up front. Stick with us. to the test day and of course the race there are a couple of other things well worth seeing during this festival of Le Mans and one is scrutineering the other is this the drivers parade on Friday it's a day off so to speak at the track and the drivers and teams head to the town and just look at the amount of people that turn out to support the drivers in the town square it's a wonderful atmosphere and We've done our best to sample as much of the food and drink here as we can in Le Mans, and it's been a wonderful atmosphere all week long. Welcome back to Speed's co continual live coverage of the Michelin 24 Hours of Le Mans, and this is your race leader, Alan McNish. He has a 30-second lead over Frank Beeler, the sister R10 Audi. And so far, so good. He's cutting his way through the traffic, no problems today. Now, the little Scotsman has really been legging it down the road today. There's no doubt about it. He's kept up the pressure. He's kept up some very good laps. I told you about the lap time to dipped a little bit, but he seems to be back right on form now. His last lap was only two tenths slower than his best lap of the day. And uh, they're nearly 10 seconds a lap faster than the than the Pescarola of Collard back in third spot. Well, he stopped the first time on lap 14, but remember, there was some caution laps. There was a couple laps of caution that we was under. He's already passed 14 laps now under green. This will be, if he does pit this lap, 15 laps on a tank of fuel. It's been green the entire time. Dorse, uh, I was talking with Alan the other day, and he said 
Le Mans really is the natural home for this R10. You got to drive the R8 yourself as we take a look at a super slow-mo. And I said, what's different about it when you first drive it? And he said, well, there are many things. He said, you know, the, the low noise for a starter. And he said, the torque is amazing. He said, but there's significant aero differences on this car as well. Can you go into details on that, Dorse? What, what you think? I know you haven't driven the R10, but what you think it might be like? Well, well they certainly have improved on aero, and they would have, because they had such good years, six good years with the R8. Um, I'm sure this makes more downforce. It's a bit heavier at the back end uh, because of that diesel engine. The torque is a major issue, no question about that. 800 foot-pounds of torque, and this car running without traction control. They have a form of traction control for it, but they haven't refined it, and the drivers have been told not to use it unless it were in the rain or something like that. So it's a handful of a car. We've seen them spin the car a couple, several times at, uh, at Sebring. Um, definitely that, that much power, it well, can get you, cut you out. Well, of course, it's got the V12 engine, which is longer than their old engine, so the whole car is longer, which obviously changes the aerodynamic package. The end of sport, Lola is in. This is Duncan Dayton. And away. They're and again. some way down the field. They've had a fairly checkered start to the beginning of this race, unfortunately, and they're still down in 45th spot going to see a lot of pit stops now and here comes the Audi race leader is in right on skid you that's 15 laps under green Whew. that is scary for the Pescarolo people now there should be a driver change coming up McNish is preparing himself to launch out of the cockpit these guys are so slick at this this is pretty to watch. Look at how quickly he's out of there. Capello is ready to step in, and McNish is out of the cockpit already. Great teamwork here as well. Now, the drivers are allowed to help each other. You can only have the fuelers working on the car, and the drivers can help each other, and, of course, the uh, brake and tyre specialists. Cal. Well, certainly now the door has been opened in terms of what mileage they're getting. That's a 15 lap stint there for Adam McNish. He plugs Dindo Capello in, and they're going to be changing tyres. So that's a double stint on these Michelins. Basically, in the heat of the day, as Brian mentioned earlier, over 90 degrees ambient right now. So extremely hot conditions. And right behind the seven machine, the eight car is in. Vila turned it over to our defending champion here, Marco Verda. So Dindo Capello, he searches for his third victory here at Le Mans. Right now, Marco Verna in the eight car is looking for his second. Frank's won three of these, so a lot of experience on, on this squad. In fact, this driving trio have had 15 podiums from the 20 starts that they've had here, so a lot of experience in this number eight machine. The differential on this car was also changed after the morning warm-up, so they saw the problem on the seven car and said, we may have the same problem over on the sister car, so that was really precautionary. Great start by the Yost team. Marco Verna underway. And in that opening stint, Frank Bieler has set the fastest time of the race thus far at a 3 minute 32 second point 691. So the German has done a good job from one German to another. Werner is on board. And of course that marvellous victory for Marco. It was great to see him finally get a Le Mans victory. And he's in search of his second. David, what's it like when you begin your first stint of the race? in Marco's shoes right now. Well, of course, A, there's a huge responsibility on the shoulders because the other guys just successfully got to some of the hairiest parts of the race, which is the start when people tend to duke it out and everybody wants to win on the first corner. How long does it take things. you to get up to your rhythm, it, though? It doesn't take long. These guys have done so much testing and so much practice in these cars uh, that they, it doesn't take them long. Uh, the tyres aren't officially heated, but they are warmed before they go on the car. So it just takes your lap to settle in, and then on a nice evening like tonight, uh, he's in for a nice uh, two-hour drive. The first accomplishment you got to do is get out of pit lane without spinning the tires or you get a three-second penalty. Know, it's a new dumb try. rule that they got. And anyway, I talked to Alan McNish and he said, you try coming out with 800 foot-pounds of torque and not spinning the tires. It's well, not, not that easy. Not spinning the tires or stalling it. Or stalling. That's what he said, stalling it. Which is Young, of course. Major issue. These cars, these R10s, are equipped with traction control, but they are choosing not to use it here at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Too much uh, shock on the drive line is what I'm hearing. You know, it's just it's just too abrupt, and it will break other things. So they'd rather not even mess with it. It's not refined as much as maybe they might like to see. Obviously, any time you, you have a you start your stint, the key thing you've got to have is information from the previous driver to tell you what the track situation is like. All right, let's get it down to Calvin with Alan McNish. 
Alan, great opening stint there. How is the race car? During the opening stint before the first fuel stop, Frankie went by. Any problems with the car? No, none at all. I just got caught in traffic in the middle of Indianapolis. And uh, Frankie, I saw, was on my right side, but I didn't know whether he was down the inside or not. So I just gave enough room that two cars could fit round. That allowed him to get the power down and come out because I was on the dirty side. Uh, but then once we got into the second stint, the car got better and came towards us, and I was able to sort of get the foot down a bit. What were you feeling in this morning's warm-up where the car had to come back to the garage and have some things fixed? What were you feeling from the driver's cockpit? Obviously, uh, the warm-up's the last chance you've got to verify the car before the race. And so I, I think it, for everybody, it was a little bit of a nervous moment. But saying that, uh, we had that in Sebring and we came back from that one, so I knew we should be OK. It's been a few years since you've won this. Is it great to be on the squad with Tom finally? Yeah, the, well, with Indo, Tom and I, I think we've got one squad that's got one goal, and that's to win. No egos, no reason to try and prove anything, just to win. All right, mate, good luck. Thank you. There he is, Alan McNish. First part of his 24-hour job is done. A very successful start as he hands over to Dindo Capello and Bieler hands over to Marco Werner. The Audi Sports squad are looking strong. Time to leave Circuit de la Sarthe just for a moment and we leave you with the top three in our respective classes. Reminding you about NASCAR race day tomorrow at 11.30am Eastern live right here on Speed as the definitive pre-race show it returns to set the grid and latch your window notes. So get fired up for race day with NASCAR race day built by the Home Depot. That's tomorrow, 11.30 Eastern, right here on Speed. Back at Le Mans. And... Coming out of Terre awesome Rouge on onto the straight. Those trees on the left, which are pretty big now, big poplar trees. When I first raced here, they were younger trees, and they were just painted white. That's all you had. <laughs> no guardrail. They just painted the bottom of the trees white so you could see them in the night. They lent a straw bale on them, I must admit. I think I'd rather not see them at all. <laughs> that's the that's case. true, yeah. Here's the first of the chicanes. You can hear that deep rum from the Corvette. Got a little loose as it came off there. You yeah. Wagged the tail. Well, maybe that torque and the heat of the day is having an effect on the Corvette because Johnny O'Connell said, you know, that he felt the rear end was going away just a little bit as he as he had that spin earlier on, which is obviously not double stinting his tyres at that stage. When the Corvette team left the test day a couple of weeks back, they said it was the best one they have ever had. They would quite often leave Le Mans with a few niggly problems and scratching their heads and with quite a healthy to-do list before coming back for the race meeting, but they said this was such a successful test and everyone was quite high in spirits. As we continue to ride with Max Pappas, it hasn't been the best start for the 63. The sister car, the 64 of Olivia Beretta, Oliver Gavin and Jan Magnussen still leads the GT1 class. And speaking of the GT cars, let's talk GT2 for a moment because we are rather a P2 because we would like to say hello to Liz Halliday, the one and only female competitor in the race and regular in the American Le Mans series. Hi, Liz Lee Diffie with you. Hi, how are you doing? Good. Tell us about the start because it was an eventful one and it seemed as though those electrical issues continued. Yeah, basically by about the second lap, um, we started having a misfire that we couldn't seem to figure out. Um, and, uh, you know, tried everything, plugs and coils. Um, ultimately, it uh, turns out that the engine was overboosting and it was a wastegate problem. So uh, boys worked really hard and... Seemed to have put it right. Felt a little slow to me still, but I think so far, touch wood, everything's going well now. I saw you in the paddock probably about an hour before the race start. You were a little bit nervous because that's the <laughs> first time you've started here at Le Mans. How was it? Yeah, it was pretty cool. I mean, I just tried to play things safe at the start. Um, wasn't going to get in any trouble. Obviously, by about the second lap, I was having trouble already. So, unfortunately, that's a... You know, short-lived, but, you know, still still really awesome to take that start and be in front of everybody and for my team. Well, not only uh, are you good at motorsport, you're also an accomplished equestrian. Tell us a little about your uh, efforts with the equestrian side of things because it's an interesting mix that you have going. Uh, yeah, I'm also a three-day event rider. Um, oh, there we go. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> well done, boys. My horses are famous now. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Well, she had the front wheels off wow, the, cool. on the road and the horse. Very nice. 
<laughs> well, how do you get those horses not to bite you? They always want to bite me. Well, that one you've seen in the pictures, he can be a bit grizzly at times, but um, <laughs> as long as you give him lots of treats, he's pretty happy. <laughs> now, you've got an event coming up, haven't you, shortly? I do. I've got an event next Saturday uh, with uh, uh, but two of my horses. So I'm um, going to be straight back home and straight back on the horses. <laughs> Well, listen, we wish you the best of luck for the rest of the race. I'm sure it's not the last time that we will talk to you throughout the 24 hours. Uh, go and enjoy a short rest, and we'll talk to you soon. Great. Thanks a lot. Liz Halliday there from the Intersport Racing Team, and they will continue to power on. That's a strong car, strong car and engine combination, and uh, that particular team had a 20-lap lead last year, only to suffer a few mechanical problems that took them out. And here's an overview of the American teams here at Le Mans this year. We are very well represented. Well, there you see the 63 car of uh, Corvette with Max Pappas at the wheel. It's down in 37th spot after that long, lazy spin. See the damage Johnny O'Connell the... had damage on the bodywork at the back. They didn't even repair that, but unfortunately they did have, say they put a toe link on, so it did hit the suspension. 16 is back in, and Emmanuel Collard out of the car. It's been a fairly smooth run thus far for the Pescarolo 16. This looks to me to be Eric Comas climbing on board. And the big news with this team, I'm sure the boys mentioned it a little earlier, was Jean-Christophe Christophe Bouillon, who was meant to start, fell over at home. I think he was putting some curtain rods up or something like that. Broke his wrist. And the team, and he stalled it, finally gets going. The team tried Christophe Bouchou, former Le Mans winner, and they said that he wasn't up to doing the quick times. And they drafted in fellow French driver Nicolas Menassion from the creation. Uh, creative creation auto sportif team very late in the piece the seven of dindo capello has an 18 second lead over the sister audi we'll be back you're watching the michelin 24 hours of le mans and this is the eight for yost audi of Marco Werner, former American Le Mans Series champion, chasing the sister car. There's only a deficit of just under 17 seconds. As we take a look at a Valvoline race reset, here are your respective class leaders. The Portuguese driver Miguel Amaral leading the P2 class. It is the Corvette, the one that is going for three consecutive class victories leads the way in the Scuderia across Ferrari 430 of Andrew Kirkaldi who leads the GT2 class. So that's how things stand at the moment. And it's been a fairly interesting first two hours of the Michelin 24 hours of Le Mans. It is still very much the battle between Audi and Pescarolo up front. And speaking of Pescarolo, here is the 16. Eric Comas has just taken over from Manu Collard, who we know so well in America from both the American Le Mans series and the Rolex sports car series. Has done a lot of racing in the US. Has been a class winner here at Le Mans, but is in search of his first overall victory. Following the number nine car, the Courage, down in uh, number nine car. I mean the five car that's running in ninth. We knew what you meant. Yeah, well, <laughs> you knew what I was trying to say. Harold Premat behind the wheel of that Swiss Spirit Courage, and they're doing a pretty good job, actually, to be in the top ten at this early stage. The Pescarolo so far has not been able to match fuel mileage with the Audi, which we knew that wouldn't be the case, but it's two laps different at stopped up stopping those pescarolos about every 13 laps and of course alan mcnish went 15 last time around yeah. two times world rally champion sebastian Loeb suiting up 
Crowd will go crazy over this one, won't they? Oh, absolutely. This guy has created such a stir here. And it was the same situation last year as well. Just so much interest in him. And we're very fortunate here at Le Mans this year to have a current World Rally champion and driver and a current Formula One driver, not only in the same race, they're in the same car. And it's French. And they both happen to be French. And he is about to take over from Frank Montagny. Pit Lane and Chris Neville. Hi, Chris. Lee, while we were away on that last commercial, the 009 did come in and Pedro Lamy handed it over to Stefan Sarrazin. Pedro, you just did a double stint last year. I know it was very difficult for the team to do double stints. Today's another warm day, but this year you look a little bit fresher. Yeah, it looks like that we can survive with double, double stint with the same tire, so we will try to do a race. I mean, now it's hot. I think when we get a bit cooler, it will be better for us, we will see. You were chasing down the Corvette number 64 there. Can you guys run uh, pace with them? Were you expecting this pace? Well, we changed the tires different timing, but we didn't expect that they were so fast after qualify. We had a feeling because I, I thought we thought that they had something in their pockets, and they, they had. All year long over in America, you've been running the Pirelli tires. You come back over here, you're running the Michelins. Has it been a difficult transition for the team? Well, we raced here last year with Michelin, so um, I, I think the, the, the Michelin has more experience in this circuit, and uh, that's why it was the team option. Good luck. Thank you. Pedro Lamy, he has raced some beautiful machinery here at Le Mans over the years. As we bring you up to date with the highlights of the first two hours, it was Alan McNish that took the tricolor and led the field up the main straight. Jan Lammers was quick to pounce on Jean-Marc Gounon and make his impact there. And speaking of impact, what about this? Fabio Babini in the BMS Scuderia, Aston. And then to the works, Aston. Darren Turner was on board the 007 and a severe oil leak put them into the garage very early. At the 45 minute mark, Frank Beeler took advantage of Alan McNish getting caught in the traffic and whipped on by early. That was a neat move. And then the 20 Pierre Bruno Pillbeam almost took Frank Beeler out as he split the two Audis. Take a look at the second hour. You're on board with Johnny O'Connell. Watch and listen. That was not expected. Got a little taily, and Johnny was left to limp back to pit lane. And there was a little bit of damage on the rear end of that car. And the Corvette boys were able to get that fixed. So good work from those guys as it's just a little after 7 p.m. local time here at Circuit de la Sarp as we take you to the class leaders in our respective classes, the two prototype classes, the two GT classes. That's how it stands at the moment as we flip over and show you the top three in each of our GT classes at the moment are the boys that are going for three straight. They are in good shape and it is that Scuderia Ecos Ferrari that leads the way over the Peterson White Lightning Crone Porsche. As we see the French car, the French team, the French driver, Frank Montagne for Pescarolo. Next year, boys, I don't know if you've spoken about this already, but it will definitely be France against Germany again, and it will certainly be a French manufacturer against the Audi, because massive news this week that Peugeot, if you haven't heard, are coming with an HDI diesel next year. Now, David, this is going to be a coupe. They're going to have a 100-degree 12-cylinder, 5.5-litre engine, and we've got problems here for the Lister, and they are going to go head-to-head -head with the diesel prototype with Audi next year. That will be fascinating. They're talking about 650 horsepower out of that, plus nearly 1,000 pounds-feet of torque. The 100-degree angle on the uh, cylinders is to get the weight of the engine low, and uh, that's going to be a big effort by Peugeot next year. So if Audi is still around, it's going to be a massive battle. Beretta's in pit lane. Calvin's there. It's going to be doing a double stint down here, Lee. They're looking at tyres. Still a little warm. Probably going to change tyres in. They've got the guns at the ready. So once the refueling is complete, Olivier will do a double stint. The tyres are only doing a single. Once the temperature cools down a little bit, I think we'll see some of these GT1 teams and GT2 teams attempt to double stint these tyres. Very much cool here with the lead car in GT1. Let's go down to Andrew. Manu, the 
pace was very hot. The pace was very hot indeed. Yes, we start really quick. But uh, unfortunately, we are a bit slower at the moment. But uh, we are still to, to push until the end and just to see if we can, uh, if we can do something. It seems to be quite difficult at the moment because they can do two more laps than what we can do and uh, they are still quicker. So wait and see. You just had Sebastian Loeb is getting in the car. You just had Sebastian come and ask you a bit of advice. And uh, what did you tell him? Yeah, he asked me if the track was OK. I said, yes, no problem. Well, thanks very much, guys. We've got a bit of a problem with our signal from here. But let me tell you, I had to wait for that interview because the person who was interviewing uh, Manu Collard before was one of his old teammates who used to drive for Pescarolo, Frank Lagos, who's now uh, joined the TV ranks. <laughs> They're all out there. My old co-driver Jean-Pierre Jabrier in the Matra back in 1972 was also... Uh, I just ran him out in the hall and look at this, the 61 car. Yeah, Tim Sugden. Dusty flat tyre. Tim Sugden in the Certec Russian age We've Ferrari. Seen, we've seen what damage those tyres can do too. If you go too fast, they come unglued. They can he's do got a, of damage to the bodywork. He's got a long, long way to go. A long way to go. And uh, we saw the Ferrari, the other Ferrari had the same kind of problem, rear tyre damage. Mm. I don't think uh, he'll make that back to the pits without doing a lot of damage. I mean, oh, it's a it's long too far. Long. He's only just started on the straight. Tim's enjoyed a good year so far in the FIA GT Championship. He won the most recent round in GT2 at Bruno. Back with more from Le Mans in just a moment. Reminding you that AMA Superbike hits speed tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern. The AMA Superbike race is into Salt Lake City. Two wheels, one winner. Don't miss it. It will be exciting. The AMA Superbike Championship tomorrow here on Speed from 4 Eastern. Meanwhile, we continue to talk four wheels because this is the legendary 24 Hours of Le Mans brought to you by Michelin. And Alex Jung is out of the racing for Holland. Dome Judd, the Malaysian, his first experience at Le Mans. And there is his first stint at Le Mans out of the way. He's done a terrific job. When he got in after they had the stop and go penalty for, well, the drive through penalty for Dan, Jan Lammers, they were late coming out because he came in early. Uh, the dome with Young at the wheel was down in 11th spot and he's just getting out of it in fifth. So, done a very good job. And this, of course, is the lineup of all former F1 drivers Stefan Johansson, Alex Young, and Jan Lammers. Now there's that getting away, you know, got to rev the hell out of the thing and not spin the wheels and not spin the clutch too much, of course, obviously, because uh, you'd soon burn that out. Of course, you can't burn out the tires. That means you have to ride the clutch, and they, they don't like that. Not when you've got to stop 23 times or thereabouts. That car is in a very strong position at, at the point where Alex Young pitted. It was a top five contender. And over the years, they have not been known to show some Good endurance reliability, never quick enough to spring a surprise, but reliability has been a feature, so we'll see if that continues. Just the one car for racing for Holland this year, and years gone by, it has been a two-car entry with the now very familiar livery. Stefan Johansson behind the wheel for his first stint. Calvin. Down here at Sefco Motorsports, Johnny Molan just jumped out, running third, Johnny. Things look pretty good so far. Oh. As you well know, Calvin, from your days driving, it's early days yet, and uh, we're just keeping out of trouble, running as a quickish race pace, sort of 58s, 59s, and just hoping that that's uh, going to keep going. If we can keep that to the end without any problems, then we'll be in with a shout of a podium or maybe better. But the car's running brilliantly. The boys have worked so hard. And the only issue we've got at the moment is the rear fender keeps on unclipping and it's flapping at high speed and giving me quite a big vibration, anything over about 120 mile an hour. So always makes it feel like you've got a flat spot in the tyre, but you just drive through it. Bell was also talking about something where on the blip on the downshift, you were struggling a bit with that, what was happening in the car. Yeah, this gearbox is quite fragile in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the gears and the uh, dog rings uh, of similar hardness and materials, so you have to really protect the gears. And my blips weren't big enough on the downshift, so they came on the radio, told me I had to flip bigger on the downshift, which I kind of knew was an issue because the brake pedal is actually in the wrong position. It's kind of moved since we started the race for the throttle. And the way I heel and toe is very different to the way Terry does, and obviously Christian left foot brakes, so he doesn't have that problem. So 
I just had to slow up my braking a little bit, make sure I got it sorted so that I don't do any damage. All right, mate, thanks a lot, good luck. Thanks a lot, thank you. Just a quick update on that, of course, they have changed gearbox. This is the first appearance for this team this year. They have gone to the X-Track transverse box, the same that is used in the Corvette. And in fact, the Corvette team have been helping out this team a little bit with gears and such forth. They have a lot more supply down with the Corvette team. Let's go down to Andrew. Yeah, I'm with Frank Montana. He's just uh, been uh, debriefing with Andre de Cortans, the designer of the car. Uh, tough, hot stint, Frank. No, well, three stints with uh, this kind of temperature and uh, those kind of car, you know, it's not easy, especially when you fight against a big factory like Hody, but uh, so far it's not too bad. The car reacts quite well. We got a little bit of understeer. I think it's quite normal because the temperature are quite high and... Uh, well, it's difficult to, 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 to say really something for the moment. I think the Audi are a little bit quicker, we are a little bit slower, but it's 24 hours, so it's cool. Yeah, uh, Manu was a bit despondent about the speed of the Audi. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. me too. It overtook me very easily. And, uh, well, we, there's nothing we can do, you know, now. And uh, the only thing we can do is to work a little bit and try to improve our state. He's going to push, push, push. Calvin. OK, down here with Peter Dumbreck. Peter, it's been a long time since that spectacular flip that you had in the Mercedes. How does it feel to now get back in a race car here at Le Mans? Funnily enough, I was just thinking about that. <laughs> um, I'm going to take, uh, I think, a, a couple of easy laps to begin, bed myself in, and then uh, we're on a, an easy strategy at the moment, just taking it easy. So. Um, I just make sure the car stays in one piece and make sure I finish my drive in one piece and uh, let's see how the next 24 hours go. There's a certain irony in the fact that you returned to Le Mans with the Spiker Squadron. I mean, these guys built airplanes several years ago, but this car has really come on gangbuster. You put the roof on the car now, it seems to have a lot more downforce, a lot more comfortable to drive, I would assume. Yeah, yeah, I think it's made big steps, even from the test, the pre-test. We've uh, gone a bit quicker here this weekend, and uh, Tom just now, Tom Cornell, he looks like he's driving easily, he's doing decent lap times, so I think we're all very happy. All right, mate, great to see you back. Thank you. There he is, Peter Dumbreck, and it is great to see him back. I can tell you that it was rated number four on the list of speeds, top ten motorsport moments. That unbelievable flip in the Mercedes in 1999 by that man right there. And Greg Cremo, Sam Posey and David Hobbs had the call. Here is that battle once again. And uh, that uh, Porsche obviously blended the, uh, the attack by the Mercedes, but... Oh! oh! It has gone oh again! Oh, there it is! It's into the trees! Right! Unbelievable! Oh. That is what we have seen twice already this weekend, and that one went off track. That is just devastating. They, of course, will have to withdraw instantly the, the other, other car. car. There's no question of doing it now. We have just seen one of the most dramatic moments that you will ever see. It's the second time in history that a Mercedes has actually left the track here. The other time back in 1955 with disastrous results. The other two times here in the last few days, the car actually stayed within the bounds of the track. But this one is off in the woods. Here's the replay, and uh, again, uh, the Mercedes right behind the Toyota, just in that dead air uh, area. And Look there. at that. That's exactly wow. the terror of it. Thank fortunate did not hit the bridge, but you could see how high up it got. Whoa. It looks like it may have landed on, on its, its wheels. wheels. This could have a happy ending yet, but of course it's much too early to say. A Mercedes was linked with Le Mans, partly through tragedy, partly through grand achievement. Uh, but this is a moment that will certainly not be quickly forgotten. And that was Ugh. one scary ride, but it yeah. did, as Sam Posey led to, it did have somewhat of a happy ending because that man there was taken to a local hospital, but I can remember I was here for Network 10 Australia and I interviewed him the very next day. So he was able to 
walk away and he was a very very lucky driver well it did come down right side up and uh, but when you see it again it was the most amazing thing he was tucked in behind that toyota just going just around the next corner not this one here but just after that there is another right hand sweep and um, there's a little kink a little lift in the road and it shoo, just got it all wrong and wow what a sight i've forgotten one how bad it was i remember that's it right there right there I remember standing behind the booth when that thing took off and thinking, oh, my God, what was that? Nobody could even believe it. Nobody would even acknowledge it at first. And, of course, that was the second that weekend, and, of course, they immediately pulled the other car. I just saw Mark Webber last weekend in Silverstone as finally Tim Sugden gets the 550 Marinello back to pit lane, and I said, hey, I'm off to Le Mans next week. I'll see your old teammate, Peter Dumbreck. He said, say hi to him for me. <laughs> <laughs> Give course, a Mark Webber. Give a high five. Yeah. <laughs> Webber was the man who set that trend in 99, wasn't he? When we come back, Greg Kramer will be joining the team. And it's about to come to its climax. A car weekend for every taste. We'll be back. Tonight on Speed. The greatest automotive endurance race in the world is back. 24 hours of Le Mans. Big slip right there. Unbelievable. Whoa. Grueling, intense, unmerciful. Catch all the action this weekend from start to finish as Speed brings you live coverage from the 74th running of this prestigious event. 24 hours of Le Mans continues tonight.